My name is John Frungen. I'm the executive director of the William J. Hughes Center for Public Policy. The Hughes Center is committed to providing opportunities for students and the community to engage on important public issues. If you appreciate the work of the Hughes Center and would like to support us, please visit us online at stockton.edu slash Hughes Center. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Harvey Kesselman, president of Stockton University, to give welcoming remarks. Thank you. Oh, good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you. And welcome distinguished guests, alumni, elected leaders, members of the judiciary and legal community, the Stockton Board of Trustees who are here with us today, our foundation board, and of course, Stockton students, faculty, and staff. We are delighted you are here today with us as we host a conversation about White House legal, judicial, and political issues with former White House counsel Don McGahn. Stockton University's William J. Hughes Center for Public Policy is committed to fostering civil dialogue and civic engagement and exploring important public policy issues of our day. Today's event offers a unique opportunity to hear from a public servant who's had a front row seat during an extraordinary time in our nation's history. I'd also like to thank Mr. Bill Hughes Jr., an attorney with the firm of Porzio, Bromberg, and Newman, and the son of the Youth Center's namesake, the late Ambassador William J. Hughes. Bill was instrumental in making today's event possible, and we are truly appreciative of his continuing support of Stockton University. The Youth Center has often provided a forum for a myriad of political voices and perspectives. Past speakers have included the Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch, New Jersey Senate President Steve Sweeney, former Vice President Joe Biden, and former Governors Jim Flory, Florio and Christine Todd Whitman, to name a few. Today, Stockton welcomes Don McGahn to discuss his experiences and his career. Don is an Atlantic City native. In fact, from initially Atlantic City and then Brigantine. His mom, Noreen, by the way, is here with us today. Will you please raise your hand and be acknowledged, Noreen? Still a Brigantine native and was a former school nurse in the Frigantine School District. He served as chief counsel for the National Republican Congressional Committee and served on the Federal Election Commission, among many other roles before his appointment as the White House counsel for the Trump administration. Having the opportunity to listen to a broad range of perspectives helps all of us to make sense of our fascinating yet complex social and political environments. Such intellectual challenges require us to commit ourselves to critical thinking, which truly lies at the very heart of civil discourse. It's what fuels our desire to learn and supports our willingness to reflect on ideas and explore multiple ways of thinking about topics and situations. This is why we are so grateful for the Hughes family and their continuing support of Stockton and our efforts to provide ongoing opportunities for engaging public dialogue. Thank you and enjoy today's conversation. Bill Hughes is an experienced litigator and principal with the law firm of Porzio, Bromberg, and Newman, where he specializes in white collar federal investigations and criminal defense. Bill has prior experience as an assistant U.S. attorney and trial attorney for the U.S. Department of Justice. Before that experience, he served as a judicial clerk with the Honorable John F. Gary, Chief Judge of the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey. Bill achieved his LLM in taxation from Georgetown University Law Center and received his Juris Doctor with honors from Rutgers University Law School. He obtained a Master of Arts degree from the Eagleton Institute of Politics and Public Policy and a Bachelor of Arts from Franklin and Marshall College. Of course, he is the son of the Hughes Center's namesake, the late Ambassador William J. Hughes. Bill, I really appreciate your participation today. Bill Hughes. Thank you. I have to say that uh, Harvey stole some of my thunder in introducing uh, Don McGahn. 
But let me first start by saying that the Hughes Center for Public Policy was created to foster a greater understanding of civic issues and to promote civil discourse. Consistent with my father's legacy, he wanted to encourage and promote the discussion of all political perspectives with the idea that listening to different viewpoints enhances understanding, fosters compromise, and ultim ultimately benefits the body politic. Don McGahn, Atlanta County native, former chairman of the Federal Election Commission and former White House counsel, is a man who my late father knew and respected. He and my dad had long conversations in the past couple of years. And what they talked about, I don't know. And I didn't ask. But my dad told me how proud he was of Don for his honesty, for his courageousness, professionalism, sense of duty, and his patriotism. Indeed, high praise from my father, who was very concerned over the bitter partisanship that exists in Washington these days and that has paralyzed our government. As Harvey has indicated, Don was born here in uh, Atlantic County, raised in Atlantic City and in Brigantine, the son of Donald and Noreen McGann. And Mrs. Uh, McGann is here tonight. Thank you so much uh, for coming today. He graduated from Holy Spirit High School, from Notre Dame University, and received his Juris Doctor from Widener University and his LLM, his Master's of Law from Georgetown University. He became an expert in election law, a partner at Pat Patton Boggs in Washington, D.C., and then he was appointed as Chief Counsel, or General Counsel, to the National Republican Congressional Committee. He was uh, appointed to the Federal Election Commission and eventually became its chairman. In 2015, Don, while a partner at Jones Day, was hired to be the Campaign Counsel for Donald Trump's 2016 candidacy. He played a pivotal role in getting President Trump on the ballots in all 50 states and fighting the rules changes during the, uh, during the meetings prior to the Republican National Convention. Don was then appointed as counsel to the transition team and ultimately to be White House counsel. As White House counsel, Don provided legal advice to the entire executive office of the president. And, uh, and we will talk today about what he did. But of particular note, Don oversaw this election and nomination in confirmation of over 107 federal judges, 40 of them to the Circuit Courts of Appeal, and two to the Supreme Court. He was in the middle of some of the most contentious confirmation hearings in the history of our republic. And I'm not just talking about Justice Kavanaugh, but many of the Circuit Court nominations were fraught with partisanship. Still, he was the successful architect, and he was, he was the guy that was in the center of changing the face of our federal judiciary. Sometime in 2017 or 2018, Don was instructed by the president's lawyer to submit to interviews conducted by the special master. These interviews, some of them, were, are detailed in the special master's reports and are currently the subject of litigation. So, and I'll discuss that in a moment. On a personal note, Don is the husband to the lovely and talented Shannon McGann an accomplished public servant and now associated with the National Realtors and the father of two, of two young boys. He is a hockey dad. Um, I have to note that he's also very humble. In 2017, fresh off the success of uh, the confirmation of Justice Gorsuch, Don and his family came to, the, uh, came to Linwood for their Easter egg hunt. And we were standing around and a reporter walked up to me and said, Bill, you were at the White House. That's so cool. I, you know, I want to interview and find out all about it. And, you know, and Don is standing right there. And I said, I'd like you to meet my friend Don. And Don reaches over and says, hi, Don McGahn. And the reporter looks at him and says, great, thanks. So tell me about the White House. I wonder. <laughs> and he looked over at me. I said, I forget it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce Don McGahn? So before I begin, uh, Please understand that Mr. McGann is a lawyer. And like all lawyers, he has to abide by the rules of professional gun conduct that govern all attorneys. Under these rules, he owes a duty to all of his former clients, including the executive office of the president. So Mr. McGann may not be able to answer all of, uh, but may not be able to answer some of those questions that I ask. If that's the case, Tan, please let me know. 
And I will ask you in the audience to understand that he is doing what the law requires of him. I, I didn't hear a word you said. Am I in the popcorn? <laughs> it's Johnson's popcorn. I know it's I can see the branding. You have good. some. You want some? Well, maybe later. I don't want to get all stuck. Uh, it, it's very tasty. It's sticky, too. I, I understand. You're used to that. I mean, you were, you were you know. Don't start. OK. <laughs> uh, my, my first question, um, and it is timely that you're here. Um, you couldn't come at, at a better time. I hear that a lot. I know. Yeah. And I have to ask this question. Um, a nation is divided. Uh, you have some on one side saying it was necessary, uh, almost required. Um, on the other side, saying the actions aren't justified, that, um, that it was rash, and that an institution is in jeopardy. Um, and I think the audience would like to know. Um, so I have to ask you, Harry and Meghan, what, what are your thoughts? It's a tough one. Not as tough as where I thought you were going. I heard she called the queen, and she thought it was a perfect call. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't know you can quit the royal family. I don't know that was a thing. I thought they kicked you out, but I'm not royal, so I'm not sure how that works. But it's fascinating. I've never really been a... A royal file. My wife filed, files it, though, so maybe, maybe you should be interviewing her. At least it didn't happen by Twitter. <laughs> uh, you were born and raised in, uh, in Atlantic City. Right. Your extended family were legendary Democrats. Your one uncle was a Democratic state senator. Your other uncle was a Democratic power broker. Uh, sometimes on the national stage. Right. They knocked off Hap Farley in the legendary Republican political machine that dated back to Nucky Johnson. Mm -hmm. How is it that you're a lifelong Republican? <laughs> I enjoy liberty. <laughs> I don't like the government. Okay. But we, we, now I'm going to start scaring you. Um, it's a good question. I get that a lot coming from a family of, of prominent Democrats. How did I end up where I ended up? My grandfather actually was Republican, and Hap Farley was his attorney. Senator Farley represented a lot of people in Atlanta County, including my grandfather, who was a, 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 owned his own bar. Um, his sons drifted Democrat. I think John Kennedy had a lot to do with that. I think, I think the, the way politics were going, it made sense. Um, and my Uncle Joe, who ran for state senate, I think in 71, defeated Farley and un, undid the Republican machine. Pat was sort of the man behind the guy, uh, so to speak, as a, as a lawyer. He, he actually did advance for Bobby Kennedy in 68, he was in California, June of 68. Right. Um, and he had done national convention in 64, that was Atlantic City, so he was very much a Democrat. Uh, I came of age later. Um, I came of age much more in the 80s under Ronald Reagan, and Reagan appealed to me. And I really did not see myself as particularly politically active uh, until later in life. Uh, my parents were not part of the political circus that, that my uncles were. Right. Uh, and in a lot of ways, they kept me away from it. Local politics, you latch on to one politician. Uh, it's great until he loses, and then you're kind of run out of town on a rail, and they, they did think that was a good life. Uh, so in a weird way, I think I probably disappointed them by going into politics, ultimately. But, um, uh, you know, things happened. So, I, you know, I came of age later. I think my family became more conservative as time went on. My Uncle Joe was essentially booted from the Democratic Party in the late 70s, uh, even though he was an incumbent Democrat senator. He later ran as a Republican in the early 80s, I think 81. I didn't know that. Yeah, he did. He ran the first independent then as a Republican. I think it was 81. It, at that point, it was the most expensive election in the history of New Jersey. It was the first to do TV advertising. Uh, at the state senate level. Governors did TV advertising, but it was the first real barn burner where people took the TV. On all three channels? And, and, and right, right, <laughs> right. The public one and the other one and the one that has kind of snow on it back Here. then, right. Um, so he actually ended up running as a Republican and then I think we, we, we drifted more that direction. I originally registered to vote uh, as an independent um, and then I, the first election I voted in, I voted for your dad. Well, thank you. Well, he was already an incumbent for years, and I, don't th I think he might have been unopposed. But still, you know, I voted, I voted, I voted for, and that was probably 92. And I'm sure that he would think. No, if, yeah, yeah, he, he would, he would, but yeah. Uh, well, you, was, you, uh, you left South Jersey. 
And you... I did. <laughs> don't say escape. Don't say it. I, I didn't. Why are you... Why are you okay, okay, what? No. Don't, don't, what? what? All don't right. judge. Um, you went to law school and became one of the country's foremost experts in election law and election financing. Uh, That's what people say. So what was that path? I mean, how'd you, how'd you end up in that? Um, I ended up uh, at a big law firm in Washington, D.C. called Patton Boggs. Uh, and uh, one of the main partners was Tom Boggs, who father had been the Democrat yeah. leader in the House and had passed in a plane crash, unfortunately. So Tom Boggs was sort of a legend to D.C. I ended up in his law firm. And there was a fellow there by the name of Ben Ginsburg who did election law. He had been the chief counsel of the Republican National Committee and all the other party committees, and he was a partner there, and I got to know him. And growing, growing up in Atlantic City, election law lawyers were the guys that impounded ballot machines on election day. Like one day a year, election law lawyers did some work. Here was a guy that did elections 365 days a year. I thought it was fascinating, and I realized that there was something that maybe I could do. Uh, and having grown up in it with family members in politics, it ended up being a natural fit. So I ended up latching on to Ben, who was an excellent mentor, worked for him for a number of years. And it started out as defense work, actually defending politicians who had already done things and were in a little bit of trouble. And being someone who did litigation and, and, and that sort of practice, I, was, I became the brief writer and the deposition defender and the, the person who actually defended politicians. And that grew, uh, as most law practices do, one case turns to two, two turns to four, four turns to eight. Next thing you know, that becomes your specialty. And then I became the general counsel of the National Republican Congressional Committee, which is one of the national parties of the Republican Party that focuses on House elections. So I did that full time, and that's when the expertise really grew. And then that led to I started my own firm for a bit and did nothing but political law. And it's not just campaign finance. It's also redistricting. It's First Amendment. It's the general regulatory compliance for campaigns um, and everything in between, government ethics and the like, and then uh, President Bush appointed me to the Federal Election Commission in 2008, and I became chairman of the FEC. When that was you, a Senate-confirmed slot, so I, 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 I know what it's like to go through that, that uh, gauntlet as well. Was that fun? No, not <laughs> fun, not fun at all. Um, well, when you became chairman, did you believe that you had a mandate? I mean, did you believe that you, you know, had, had, to, had a mission to do something? Well, I don't know if mandate's the right word. Mandate's something politicians use. Agency heads aren't really up for office. I always kept in mind I was never elected. I was appointed. So right. it's, a, it's a big difference. Um, the elected officials are supposed to really make the big decisions for us, not unelected people. Um, but the mandate, if there was one, was really coming from the courts. The Supreme Court was starting to strike a lot of what was called McCain-Feingold, which was a campaign finance reform law passed in the early 2000s. And there were already a couple cases that had begun to chip away at it. Uh, and lower courts were chipping away at it because some of it was pretty unconstitutional. And when I was at the FEC, a case called Citizens United came down, and that really was, um, to me, the logical conclusion of what a number of decisions prior to Citizens United had said. So to the extent I was, I was taking orders, it was from court orders, which I think are binding on agencies, and the Supreme Court speaks as to what's constitutional and what's not constitutional. You have to follow it. Well, was Citizens United a good decision or a bad decision? Yeah, it was a good decision. I mean, it was, it was, it was correct, I think. Uh, when I go and talk at law schools or teach at law schools, I always ask the class who thinks Citizens United was correctly decided. Uh, and maybe one kid sheepishly puts up his hand. Well, who thinks it was wrongly decided? Everybody puts up two hands. Oh, it's horrible. And then in the course of my talk, I will, I will then work in that can the government ban, uh, say, a movie uh, available on pay-per-view cable that only adults can watch in the privacy of their own home simply because it says bad things about somebody who's running for president. And the entire class says, of course not. That violates the First Amendment. And then I'll say, well, you just ruled with the majority in Citizens United, because those are actually the facts of Citizens United. The media, commentators, academics, and others have, have, have you know, sensationalized it. But at its core, the case was about trying to ban a movie on pay-per-view cable. What's really shocking about it is four Supreme Court justices said the government can ban that movie. Um, well, regardless of the merits of the decision, was the, what do you think the impact of that decision was? Was it positive, negative, neutral? Look, I, I, I'm, I'm one who thinks that more speech is better in a free society and a democratic experiment that we have. I think that voters need to be more informed, not less informed. So removing, removing restrictions on speech generally are a good thing. Uh, I think that prior to Citizens United, 
wealthy individuals and corporations did TV ads, they did a lot of campaign uh, uh, things, but they avoided saying vote for, vote against, and, and sort of words of advocacy. Now Citizens United merely says you can go all in and it's clear that you can say vote for, vote against. So the practical impact, really, I don't, I don't see it as nearly as big as others see it uh, because people were doing it before, people were doing it after. Remember, you go back to the original law in the 70s, the Supreme Court in the mid 70s struck a lot of the similar kind of restrictions that they tried post Watergate. So it's not a new concept that the Supreme Court would not take kindly to speech restrictions. Well, do you, setting aside Citizens United, okay. do you see the role of big money in election as a systematic problem or as an acceptable form of political speech? Or do you have another perspective? My perspective actually is that we are evolving out of the idea of big, big money, buying a bunch of TV ads and really doing much to influence voters. That was the norm and the perception 10, 15, 20 years ago. Now but the internet has really leveled the playing field, right? Yeah. Now it's no longer the rich guy with the printing press who controls what people hear. Everyone in a way is their own version of, 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 a, of, a, of a journalist and everyone kind of has their own printing press because of the internet. So it's much cheaper now to get your message out if you're a candidate. Things are still very expensive. You ran for office, you know this. But as time goes on, I think, I think the, the leveler has been the fact that people are moving away from TV. Secondly, how many people really watch TV anymore and watch all the ads? A lot of people DVR shows, a lot of people watch things on Netflix. So this massive media buys that people used to do just don't get you the bang for the buck they used to get. So I think at the end of the day, we're growing our way out of the idea of the rich guy buying the bigger megaphone. It would be buying the bigger megaphone on television and direct mail. But now you have such, such the thing as, as micro-targeting. Right. Uh, you have the, uh, you know, the efforts to utilize the data on Facebook and, and other social media uh, to try and reach voters through, uh, through fake accounts and like, uh, and through basically social engineering. Um, and some of that costs big money. And, and using a, a, a dark money shield, you don't know where that's coming from. Is that something that we should be looking at and, and we should possibly be regulating or somehow keeping an eye on it? You baked a lot into that one. I did. A lot in there. I, I not have, in the speech, you got all kinds of things. Like, like whenever some someone brings that up, why not? Why not? Yeah, come it, on. It'll help. It, it, that's, that's, yeah, not as sticky, I, that's not as sticky as your question. There you go. Very good. I understand that. That's pretty um, good. Uh, could you repeat the question? <laughs> now, look, if you go back to the founding of the country, uh, Publius, right? Anonymous Federalist Papers. So the idea of anonymous speech in and of itself is not something that, is, is, that really concerns me that much. Now, you have distorting influence of, of, of money and that sort of thing, and those arguments have been going on for a long, long time. We have been toying with this in our, in our system of government for a long, long time. The debate's gonna continue, and there's, there's well-developed views on both sides. I happen to be more on the side that I think more speech is better than less speech, and the idea of trying to regulate it and level it when we've tried to do that has actually caused things to even be more skewed. I, I understand what you're, uh, what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, so you live here, you're from here. From here, I don't live here anymore. I know, so you live and work in DC, but you're a South Jersey guy. Right? Originally, yes, right. And is there anything distinctly South Jersey that you bring with you? I mean, when, I, uh, when you and I had lunch, what was it, about a year, year and a half ago, uh, we ran into Kellyanne Conway from Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And she, she greeted me with the traditional South Jersey salutation. What the hell are you doing here? <laughs> Do you bring anything uh, South Jersey to your job? Um, my native tongue is sarcasm. You <laughs> <laughs> can't shake that, right? Sort of the part of the culture here, I guess. Okay. You know, we have a certain sense of humor. We the beach. Do. We, I understand yeah. that. Um, well, how is it that you ended up representing Donald Trump's campaign? That's a good question. I get that one a lot. I, uh, I uh, had gotten to the point in my career where I would be one of the sort of people you would call if you're gonna run for high office. So I'd, I'd had enough campaigns under my belt, enough representations that I was fortunate enough to be one of the people that a lot of campaigns reached out to. Uh, and I had a client, uh, actually Citizens United, um, and the head of Citizens <laughs> United, 
Dave Bossy and I were talking one day, and we were handicapping who may, who may run, who may not run. And Dave said, what about Trump? You might like Trump. And I said, Trump? Is he even Republican? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's conservative. Yeah, yeah, you guys would get along. I was like, well, okay. Um, you sure? He said, yeah, you know, what? I know him. I, just, let's go meet him. I said, okay, we'll do that. So I went up. I was, in, I was arguing a case in the Southern District of New York for Citizens United. And afterwards, I went to meet Mr. Trump. And we kind of hit it off and talked a little bit about family and, and little things. And I got a call to come back and see him a couple more times. We talked more about politics and his views on the world. At that point, I had a view, still do have the view, that the parties have really de-aligned. The usual issue sets that elect people to the presidency on either side of the aisle have really decoupled from the norm. And that for a Republican to win the White House, it would not have to be the same old religion that Republicans have been offering. Uh, and there are a couple books I had read, one from a guy named Hendrick Smith at the New York Times, another one by uh, Charles Murray. I think, I think that one's losing ground, one from the left, one from the right, but they both were talking about how most Americans were feeling kind of left behind, left out, and the like, and that no one was really speaking to it. And when I met Trump, a lot of what he instinctively was saying would resonate with that. So I, I had a lot of data that, that backed up what his instincts uh, were saying, and I thought, you know, this guy could actually win. And part of when you're representing campaigns, you like to pick winners. So I got to know him, and then I, when he decided he was really going to seriously explore it, I set up that operation, and we became a candidate. I was counsel to the campaign, and, and here we are today. So I, I, thought he, I thought he could win, and at the time in Washington, everyone thought I was nuts. I mean, they, I've been known to throw my career away every, about every 18 months representing different politicians, and I'm still, I'm still going. And at that point, people thought, why, why are you bothering with Trump? Why aren't you doing you know, one of the more regular candidates. And I said, because I don't think one of the regular candidates has a chance of beating Hillary Clinton, but I think Donald Trump does. And people thought I was cuckoo. And here we are. Well, it, it's Still might of, be cuckoo, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, do you really did, want me to answer that question? Well, he did win. I knew that's true. Um, and there we have it. Here we are. Um, so, but in the former, Along those lines. Yeah. In the former Trump, uh, Trump Taj Mahal, there was a bar called Patty's Saloon. Apparently. Yeah. Which was it never named. really was in that property. So I, I worked at the Sands as a lifeguard. I couldn't afford going down to uh, Taj Mahal. Uh, I understand that. Uh, but that was named after your uncle, Patty McGann. And he was casino Donald Trump's, uh, casino magnet Donald Trump's lawyer for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And then he wasn't, just like that. Then there were the lawsuits. Patty sued for fees. Donald returned fire and sued back, alleging that Patty overcharged him on on, uh, on his fees. It was not just a business. It was not just businessman Trump's modus operandi of turning on his vendors and people who worked for him. It was against your extended family. Did any of that register in the back of your mind when you received a call asking if you wanted to work for the Trump campaign? Well, it wasn't really a call asking if I wanted to work for the Trump campaign. But the, but the concept, it's coming up, and you ever, you ever think well, in the back of your mind? Yeah, look, I got, look I got along with them, and you know, at the risk of being sort of crass, I mean, I got paid. Um, I did fine. Um, okay. And, and you know, there's, there's three sides to every story, you know, each side, and then sort of somewhere between are the, is, the, is the truth. And, and I, I, you know, at that point, Pat had passed. He had told me a little bit about what happened. I was too young at the time, as were you, to really remember right. the details. So it really wasn't my concern. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, it really goes back to, for those who are really into the history of Atlantic City, there was a helicopter crash where the Trump helicopter crashed, and the folks who had been Trump's managers passed away. Right. Pat litigated the case. Trump trusted him with the case. The new management came in and clashed with my uncle, and they were the ones that really accused him of of you know, overbilling and, and they didn't pay him and they were complaining about him all the time. And uh, you know, that, that happens. So it's just it's one of those things. And, and oddly though, whenever, uh, when I first met with uh, Mr. Trump, uh, it wasn't until much later on, Washington Post actually had a, I guess a profile on me where they, they, where they were the first ones to bring this up. And, and apparently it was news to everybody. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he said, wow, and he just was very praiseworthy of my uncle and said, man, he was tough, he was a tough Marine, I, you know, he was the best thing I ever had in Atlantic City and just poured it on thick. So that told me my instinct that it was really more between the management of the properties down here and my uncle, not so much personal with, the, with, with Trump, was, was probably correct. But, 
you know, that's a different generation, a different time, and mm -hmm. I'm a different guy. Well, as the, uh, as the counsel of the tramp, uh, to the campaign, mm -hmm. what did you do? What were your, what were your responsibilities as a, as a Well, lawyer? campaign lawyers have to, have to pay attention to a lot of different things. Uh, candidates have to do everything from get on the ballot in all 50 states to filing personal financial disclosure forms, disclosing their finances, to complying with campaign finance laws. All the material has to be reviewed for compliance for everything from campaign finance to copyright you know, to, to if you're doing mail, postal rate law, telephones have telephone laws. So you have to be uh, knowledgeable in a lot of areas to actually do a campaign. Uh, then for presidentials, you have delegate selection, which is the convention process. The lawyers tend to run that, and that was done by, by my folks. So it's a, it's a very complicated thing to do, and it's not the sort of thing that you do really anywhere other than for a handful of clients every, every four years at the presidential level. But every campaign, to a certain extent, is the same. So it's the same basics of getting on the ballot, raising money, spending money, and then if it's, if it's close, you have a recount. If not, you declare victory or you, or you move on to the next one. Well, tell us about election night. Well, election night uh, was a long night. I, I, had, I had thought we had a shot. Uh, Hillary Clinton going to Texas kind of told me we had a shot because she was not paying attention to the, to the, the upper Midwest and, the, and, the, and sort of the, the, what we call the Rust Belt of the country. Uh, and Trump was surging there. And I remember... Um, it was probably two, three in the morning that uh, it became clear it looked like Trump was projected to win. As a lawyer, we had our own operation uh, that was separate and apart from the party going on upstairs. We had a whole team of lawyers and operatives tracking everything. We had people on airplanes, people in different states. We were preparing in case there were recounts. It turns out, people forget this, there were three recounts in the 2016 presidential election, fully litigated statewide recounts, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. So we instantly pivoted to managing those and making sure those were, were happening. Uh, so election night for a lawyer is never really a celebration. Of all the campaigns I've done, all the politicians I've represented, I've never been to a victory party. I've always been in a back room somewhere preparing for the worst and assuming that something would go wrong, we'd have to go, go to court the next day. So you never went to the victory party? No. No? Okay. Nope. No. Watched it on TV. Governor Christie was, was there. He, he, he carried the mantle for New Jersey. Did he have that stunned look? No, he did not. He was excited. He was, Chris was excited that night. Okay. Yeah. Everyone, oh, everyone's it, excited. It, it was, it, it was the, the, Meanwhile, the, I was panicking that there were going to be recounts and you know, where are the ballots and what was going on in this state and that. Just because the media projects a winner, there's still a whole underbelly that goes on post-election. There's canvassing of the ballots. There's challenging ballots. There's something called provisional ballots now. Used to be that if you weren't on the voting rolls and you showed up, you just couldn't vote. Uh, if you didn't register to vote by a certain date before the election, you couldn't vote. Now, much more flexible, people have much more opportunity to vote, and now if you're not on the rolls or there's a mistake, you can still vote a provisional ballot, and then the fight is over whether they count, and that's fought out after the election. So sometimes elections you think are decided, but then there's a whole pile of ballots that haven't been counted yet. Well, you ought to move back to New Jersey. You could vote forever. Sometimes twice, <laughs> so I hear. How did you end up being White House counsel? Uh, President-elect asked me. It's really just that simple. It's not a Senate-confirmed position. He picks it. He gets to pick his core team. Uh, and he decided that uh, I should be his counsel in the White House. There's no application process, no TV show. Yeah, just, but uh, like how soon? Was it victory night? Was it no, it actually reasons? wasn't. It took a little bit. Um, it wasn't really till right about Thanksgiving weekend that it was announced. The assumption was it was going to be me there's a transition operation that actually happens before the election. There's various charts and that kind of thing, mapping out who would be who. And all the charts, I was sort of slotted in to be White House counsel. Uh, now, were those... But was, no, one bothered no, to, no one bothered to ask me for a couple weeks. Wait a minute. But originally, the transition was Chris Christie. Christie, yeah. Chris was and, the... And, yeah. and then he wasn't. <laughs> well, he wasn't. I mean, it, it, Trump won, and then, and then he shifted it over to Mike Pence, who was going to be the vice president. That was already decided. There's a lot of books and reporting on what happened. And, yeah, you yeah, know, you no, can believe whatever you want to believe. No, but, no, just, yeah, there, was, there was a transition within the transition. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. But, um, I, but I was a constant. You were a constant? Apparently. Okay. And so as, as White House counsel, I, right. so, w please tell people what you do. Well, um, the counsel to the president is a position that dates back to 
I guess, FDR in the New Deal. First White House counsel was a fellow who was a state legislator and then a judge in New York. And originally, he was essentially the speechwriter. The lawyer was the man with the pen, and he was the man with the turn of phrase. And apparently, the first White House counsel was the guy who coined New Deal. He wrote the kind of New Deal speech, the day which lives in infamy. He, you know, that was the you know, was kind oh, of speech the, writer, the, right? the White House counsel wrote that. Yeah, White House counsel did that. And it was kind of one person. And back then, the attorney general was seen as sort of the president's lawyer, and, and all the legal work was really done out of the Department of Justice. That was the norm for decades. Uh, you know, Kennedy's White House counsel was his speechwriter. And, and uh, there was a fellow named Clark Clifford under, under Johnson, who was much more of a lawyer uh, than speechwriter. But even then, it was still the, the attorney general that did the work. All this changed with Watergate, um, and we don't have to revisit that here, but you know, the White House counsel got caught in his own uh, problems, and uh, the attorney general had his own problems. And post Watergate, there was a big push in Washington for DOJ to be much more independent of the president. So post Watergate, the White House counsel kind of filled the gap that occurred between DOJ and the president when it came to giving legal advice. So it evolved into a role where you're essentially the principal legal advisor to the president. And in theory, the last signature on something for legal sign off before the president acts. Um, it varies in different administrations how much role the White House counsel has, but the real first modern White House counsel was a guy named Fred Fielding under President Reagan. He had the job for about six years, and he really sort of is a role model for how it functions. It's, your principal job is advising the president on his powers under the Constitution or statutes. Uh, it's not doing personal law. It's not worrying about his will or his estates or that kind of thing. You represent the president in his capacity as president. Um, and this was, you know, it's, for some, it's kind of a theoretical concept. Having represented a lot of members of the House and Senate, is very similar in that whether you're acting official capacity, personal capacity, or campaign capacity, I would represent the president in his capacity as president and advise him on essentially presidential authority, in addition to all sorts of other things like contracts and other things that concern the executive branch. But that's the basic uh, gist of the job. Well, did you have an organization? Who was your client? Was it the office? The president. So it was the, the, the president whoever that may be. Capital P. Well, right, but the only one picked me, so right. it was yeah. that, it was that, that person. Right. right. I mean, like, um, I like to think like George Washington was my client, but it, you know. It, right. it, but it, you right. represent the president. You, yeah, you, you did. For, one past White House counsel told me you're sort of the institutional conscience. You have to think about past precedents, what the future precedents will be, and you have to act kind of not in the, in the heat of the moment, but you have to think more long term and think about the, you're really speaking for the presidency as an institution, not the particular man. But the reality is, a single man is the president. So the president, capital P, is the client. OK. And what about the executive office of the president? That also, you provide legal for that. You also help the White House staff with their ethical obligations and things. Uh, there is a separate legal office that's actually the executive office of the president has its own general counsel who reports up to the White House counsel. OK. So there's a. White House counsel's office varies between maybe 25 lawyers to 50 to 60 lawyers, depending on how busy the workload is. I started out with about 25 lawyers that answered to me in the White House counsel's office. There was about 10 in the executive office of the president's legal office that reported to me. And then all the cabinet officials have their general counsels and legal staffs, and they sort of dot, dot line, you know, we call it dotted line to me for sort of legal uh, support and decisions if there was sort of a disagreement among the lawyers in the administration. Oftentimes, the White House counsel breaks the tie. Well, so you handle ethics, HR issues, right? Uh, security clearances, right? Um, the executive orders. You, right. You're the that, last that sign does. off. Right. Do you actually draft the executive orders, or does somebody really. else draft them? In no, the it's it not really. Usually, they come up from the agencies and the, the cabinet official that has the subject matter expertise in that. Usually, they draft it, and then it goes through a process where it goes through an interagency process and everybody kind of weighs in. The White House counsel is not sitting there drafting executive orders usually. Right. There well, are times where you do. There are right. you know, short ones and there are things, particularly on the national security side, where things are on a need to know basis. Sometimes you do end up drafting the documents yourself uh, because it's not the sort of thing you want to tell the whole world about before you do it. Um, I remember during a time when you had there were issues regarding the security clearances, questions regarding ethics uh, of certain individuals, um, and everything else. But I remember you talking 
uh, uh, me about one day about something that you were complaining about, and that was the contract for the White House Easter eggs. Yeah, it was a tough one. We had the Easter egg hunt, Easter egg roll, and it was a day where something was going on internationally, and, and the, the, I had to look at the Easter egg contract, and we had some edits, and, and, and then I had to go down to the Situation Room to, to do, you know, sort of grown-up stuff, and, and uh, you know, the poor person doing the Easter egg contract was just cursing my name, couldn't find me, can't, I must be slacking, you know. So that's the interesting thing about the job, is you go from worrying about, you know, Easter eggs to the most sensitive national security issues in the blink of an eye. Um, not to diminish the Easter egg thing, it is a government contracting process, and every year there's always somebody who tries to, you know, make a little too much on the eggs. So you have to, you have to be careful <laughs> with that. You know, just it, of course, you know, we have Atlantic City, we all laugh at that, but you know, it's not funny to get caught. That's no yolk. That's that's. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Is, <laughs> Don't thank me. <laughs> I do weddings, bar mitzvahs. Right. Is, Second show at nine, catch bar though, come on back. <laughs> Remember your servers. Is, is Twitter now an official uh, vehicle for policy statements of the president? It can be, it can be. His is a personal uh, feed, uh, it's, uh, but legally, it really bore everybody. It's actually maintained for purposes of the Presidential Records Act. This was a law put in place after Watergate where records of the White House and the executive branch are maintained. They ultimately go to the archives and someday they're released. So the Twitter feed is, 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 is captured. And even if it gets deleted, it's still memorialized for the future and, and the archives will decide what goes public and not public. There was some litigation over it uh, and, and a court decided that because the president did use it to make certain uh, public policy announcements, he couldn't block various users as, as like regular Twitter users can, can do. So it's, it's kind of official, but it's, it's technically a personal one, but it is compliant with the applicable federal laws that apply to any other federal record. Well, when you became White House counsel or, or at any, other, any time during that, do you ever call up any of the prior White House counsels? All the time. And say, you know, is this normal? What, what do I do? Sure, and I think, I think my predecessors did too. I had a great group of prior White House counsels who were very helpful and I thought that they gave me good advice going in and it was good to have them close by and, and I would stay in communication with them, both sides of the aisle. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that was my next question. Yeah, were they yeah. Democrat? I mean, it's, were they... it's, it's one of these things where if you're thinking about the presidency, you'll want to know different points of view and how different people did the job. And when I, when I got the job, um, what I did was I went around and met with some of my predecessors. And he hates when I say this, but the first one I met with was Bob Bauer, who was Obama's White House counsel for a bit and also his campaign counsel. I've known Bob forever. Uh, he's, he's older, but we have a similar practice background and that kind of thing. And he gave me a lot of good advice on how to do the job. And then I met with Fred Fielding and, and uh, A.B. Culvahouse, who was uh, Reagan's counsel at the end. Boyd and Gray was Bush's White House counsel. And a number of others uh, gave me other advice along the way. So Neil Eggleston was Obama's last. He, Neil was very helpful as he was going out the door. So it's one of these things that you just don't show up and think you know it all. I really put some time in to sort of get a sense of what came before me, and I tried to do things that people thought worked for them and tried to avoid the things they said that didn't work for them. Um, you said earlier that you were the, uh, the, the lawyer to the president with a capital P. Right. Lawyers have s several roles, and we learned this in law school and, and ethics. They are advocates, they are advisors, mm -hmm. and they are scriveners. And today you've spoken about your role in two of them. You know, so you were as an advisor and as a scrivener, I guess, on, on, on the contracts. Is, uh, is that mainly what the focus is? Is, is the White House counsel ever you're, an advocate? You're an advocate. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I, people would say, editorials and whatnot, you know, you, know, you represent the people. And I would say, I, it's not quite right. I represent Article Two of the Constitution. The people are in the White Dome, right? That was what your dad did, represent right. the people, right? And under our system, we have three branches of government. And I'd be, an, I'd be an advocate for presidential power. If Congress had an oversight letter, my office would handle it, and we'd, 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 we'd put, the, put up our best fight for the executive branch. Uh, within the executive branch, not everyone agreed on the path forward. Oftentimes there was disagreement over the applicable legal framework and I would have to be the one 
uh, trying to uh, develop the legal framework in a way that would allow the president to, to make a sound decision. So you are an advocate uh, for your respective uh, powers, authorities, and, and privileges. It's not the sort of lawyer that typically goes to court and argues. There's a TV show, Designated Survivor, um, fascinating show in that it was completely preposterous. But uh, the White House counsel there was routinely going to federal district court and arguing motions. It's not really what the White House counsel does. Department of Justice is really the outward facing lawyers for the administration. They're the ones that go to court. White House counsel tends to be the inward facing within the government, uh, being an advocate for the president within the agencies and behalf of Congress on, 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 the, on the separation of powers. Well, you, but you said also that you represent the president, not, but not in a personal capacity. Right. Well, how do you tell the guy who hired you that you're not really his lawyer? In a personal sense, or do well, you? there's there's there's, there's, a, there's apparently a variety of techniques <laughs> to do that. I tend to be a direct guy. Um, you know, it's the same way any lawyer has to tell. Every lawyer has had situations like this, um, particularly if you represent anyone in a corporation or in a union or any any kind of organization. Every lawyer that represents any kind of organization was hired by someone, maybe the CEO, maybe the president of the union, maybe the president of the trade association, maybe the president of the nonprofit. And at a certain point, that person will probably say, I really want to do this. And you're going to have that awkward conversation where you have to say, under the bylaws, you got to take this to the board. And then they'll say, but I hired you. That's right, to tell you, you have under the bylaws, you have to take this to the board. So any lawyers who have done any kind of representation of entities, this will resonate as true, that there's times where you have to say, Look, I hear you, but this is my view of your power under whatever your particular legal framework is you're operating under, which is whether it's a corporation or a union or a trade association or the president of the United States. So it, House it? and Senate members have the same thing. They, they, you know, they, they have limits on what they can do under the ethics rules. And for years, I advised them. And there were times where they really, 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 really wanted to do something. And it, their chief of staff would call and say, well, the, you know, the congressman really wants to do this. And I would say, I really wanted a reindeer when I was five years old. I didn't get it. I got over it. You can't do it. So I kind of had a reputation as being someone who really was not shy about trying to say, here's what you can and can't do. Uh, and you know, some people, that's not how they do it. They kind of mouse around, and that kind of leads to problems. Did um, were. Was your ability to uh, be direct, were you ever afraid that, uh, hey, look, they may not like what they're hearing and not yeah, be that's, out of a job? Look, I've been in D.C. since 1995. That's, that's, that's every day. That's every day representing people in the, in the, in the political fray, uh, whether it's an elected official or their consultant or their chief of staff or their pollster. You know, my whole career has been, has been saying, probably not the way you want to do that. Now, what I try to do is then say, look, I understand where you're trying to go. Let's try it this way. You just don't want to come in and say, oh, no, 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 I can't do that, right? And, and the thing about advising the president is that under Article I of the Constitution, which is where the Congress kind of is born, that's one of enumerated powers. It lists what they do, right? Taxing power, right? right? Copyright, right? List. Executive power does not have a list. It's executive power, whatever that means. And that has been something that has ebbed and flowed uh, for over 200 years. And it's been a constant battle between the Congress and the president, the president and the court, Congress and the courts. And it's just part of that fabric where there is no manual on the shelf in the White House that gives you the right answer. So you have to kind of, you know, do the best you can. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of these things where uh, it, a lot of it turns on your view of, of the Constitution and presidential authority vis-a-vis -vis the other branches, and part of the calculation is, you know, what other branches are going to say or not say. So it's not as simple as, as just reading, you know, a will and saying, okay, well, Joe gets this much and Pat gets that much. There's a lot more to it when you're advising, you know, the president. Uh, and, and I get that. But presidents who tend to be, as a, as a whole, mm -hmm. forceful personalities. They, they are. <laughs> they wouldn't be president. Yeah. Something special about someone who gets up and looks themselves in the mirror and say, I'm going to be president of the United States. I've never done that. Have you? No. I mean, you, you said I can be a congressman. I, that's as far as you, but you know, yeah. the idea like I'm going to win the big one, that's, yeah. not a, that's not a usual person. No. 
Yeah. And, but when they hear advice that they don't like right. or they don't want to hear. Right. I mean. That's life in the big city. It's life in the big city. Yeah. Well, in providing advice, should political considerations take, play any part in providing legal advice to, to, you, to, you to know, the president? You know, the, the correct answer is no, you should just give the legal analysis. But part of the legal analysis when it comes to constitutional law, particularly when it comes to dealing with the Congress, has to factor in political considerations. You have to think about the personalities, what are they going to question, what are they not going to question. And is that politics or is that law or is it a hybrid of the two? I think it's a hybrid of the two. The lawyer shouldn't be playing politics, right? We shouldn't, the lawyer should not be a, a policymaker of the sort like the Domestic Policy Council is and getting in there, giving their advice on what the tax code ought to say. It's not the role of the lawyer. The role of the lawyer is to give the legal advice. Example, you know, on the trade, trade issue, right? Um, there were people in the White House who, who are more, or, you know, who, who have one view, another group has another view, thing I'm proud of is that both camps thought I was their guy. They thought I agreed with them because I was just trying to call the balls and strikes, but I was not in there putting my thumb on the scale, you know, cooking the law to favor one side or the other. Policy folks have to fight it out. President makes a decision on that. That's not the lawyer's job. The lawyer's job is to say, look, you, you either have that authority under the statute or the Constitution or you don't, uh, and you're not supposed to play it. If people think you're playing politics with your legal advice, they stop listening to you as a lawyer. And then you just become another voice in the room, and then things tend to go south from there. Well, how would you describe your legal philosophy or your approach to the law? Um, you know, that came up once. I had someone actually say, I don't understand why you're involved in this. You're just a lawyer. And I said, well, because it's government, and government is one of laws, and, and the governing legal framework is really important, and that's why I'm involved, and, and the policy choice is not mine. And then I, I said, look, at the end of the day, you have a president who ran on, in part, a certain kind of judge, a certain kind of judicial philosophy. Remember, Justice Scalia had passed. There was a vacancy. And, and President Trump on the campaign trail talked a lot about the Supreme Court, put out a list of potential people he put on the Supreme Court. And I said, I remember in a meeting, I said, I said, it should not come as a surprise that the White House counsel's legal views is going to be very similar to that of people named Scalia and Thomas and Alito and Roberts and Jackson and Rehnquist. And you're probably not going to have me come in and say, you know, I think Elena Kagan's right on this one. So my views reflect those of the first group of names that I mentioned, and, and that's kind of how my style of reading law and reading the Constitution. Well, you are a, uh, you are a member of the Federalist Society and yes. considered one of their heroes. Well, um, I, they, if you say so. What is it? Federalist Society is a group of lawyers and law students founded in the early to mid-80s by a couple law professors and law students. One of the founders was, was Nino Scalia, and that being on the Supreme Court. David McIntosh, one of being a congressman from Indiana, was another one of the founders. And it was a reaction to what was seen as, as activist uh, judicial opinions that seemed to be more policy-based, not legal-based. So it was, a, it was a society that was designed to be a counterweight to what had been the conventional wisdom on campuses and among, among scholars. Uh, to try to return reading law to actually reading the law, the text comes the constitutional law, really trying to get into the original understanding of what the, what the, what the Constitution was supposed to do. And it's grown uh, by leaps and bounds over the years. I was the president of my chapter in law school and have been a member ever since. And, and it's, 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 it's much more in fashion now to be part of the Federalist Society, but it's, a, it's not a partisan group. It does not file briefs in court, unlike the ABA. ABA takes positions in court now. Federal Society does not do that. They have national conferences. They give continuing legal education. Uh, a number of judges come and moderate panels, and, and they tend to have people on both sides. I remember when I was young, coming to some of the earlier, earlier conferences in the 90s, they had the ACLU lawyer up there. They had, they had, they had a, a range of people across the spectrum. So it's a, you know, it's a lawyer group. You pay dues, and, and you know, we kind of fashion ourselves as the, the textualist types. The, the textualists, which... And they had a great influence in, in assisting you in uh, identifying candidates to go on the bench. That, right. Well, I, you know, I'm a member, been a member, so I don't know. I, never, I didn't see it as them assisting. I kind of saw it as all one. They are, the, they are me, I am them, and, and, and you know, everyone in my, on my team, I think, is a member of the Federalist Society. So it wasn't like it was some outside group 
okay. that we had to go call and get their advice. We, you know, we're we're very much of that school of thought. But yeah, they 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 help um, with a network, and you get to know people over the years. And a lot of the people who ended up uh, being on the bench because President Trump appointed them were people I had met or someone in my office had met over the years, oftentimes at Federalist Society conventions. So it's a it's a it, it creates sort of a national network of of talent, and so you get to know who's who. And you get older, and next thing you know, right? Well, here I, we are. We're bleeding into the, to another topic area, which I'm uh, we're skipping over one, but that's okay. We'll talk about uh, judicial nominations. Okay. Perhaps more than any White House counsel in the history of our republic, you were the architect of changing the face of our federal judiciary. You spearheaded the nomination and confirmation of over 107 federal judges. Over 40 of those were to the Circuit Court of Appeals and there are only 179 slots. The uh, number of active conservative judges on the bench increased from 40% to 51%. All of them young, most of them conservative, and they will all be there for life. This is not to mention the two very significant appointments to the Supreme Court, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. What was your approach to identifying individuals to be nominated? What was my approach? Well, you know, it, it's to sort of give life to what the president wanted to do. I mean, ultimately, he makes a decision. I mean, it's very kind to say all that, but my name's not on the commission. I don't make the appointment. The president does. I just advise him on what I think. And, and I was very fortunate that he put a tremendous amount of trust in me to, to come up with the names and do the vetting and think about the strategy to get them confirmed and the like. Um, I think that what the president was looking for were folks who wanted to read the law as it was passed, not what they wanted it to be, and, and sort of return more to a fundamental uh, 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 textualist approach to the law and not be someone who saw themselves as social avatars of change or the like. Um, and I, frankly, there's a generational shift there. I think there were, uh, the Bork hearings were something that inspired me in a lot, a lot of ways to go to law school. Um, and, and Bork was a, is a former Solicitor General DC Circuit judge nominated by President Reagan for the Supreme Court. Um, was defeated in the Senate. Uh, Joe Biden was the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee at the time and kind of orchestrated the defense and the, the opposition to Bork. And a lot of what happened in the Bork hearings kind of caused a, a big bang. And I think if people came of age legally post Bork, they had a certain view of the law that didn't really exist in the mainstream so much before Bork. And, and so what the president really wanted were folks that are sort of post-Borkian constitutionalists and textualists. Uh, and he also liked folks that were not of DC. The old model to succeed was went to a go to a fancy school, get a clerkship, and go to the Department of Justice and write fancy memos and hang around Washington, DC. And then you end up being put on the bench. Um, Funny thing happened over the past 10 years or so. A lot of folks, they might have been to D.C. a couple of years, but they moved home, and they, they maybe became state judges, state Supreme Court justices. They may have done appellate work for their state attorneys general. They may have set up appellate practice. So you had people in state capitals doing really cutting-edge stuff, um, and they were not of Washington, and that was very appealing to the president. And a lot of these folks are now circuit judges because they were actually moved home on the field of play and actually, actually showed some gumption when they, when they took on some tough cases, which is the third thing. The president really liked people who had been on the field of play. It was clear where they were on issues. They were not afraid of a fight. They represented clients. Uh, and you know there was, a, there was a conventional wisdom for a while in DC. You didn't want to nominate people with a so-called paper trail because then people would knew where you were and you can get attacked by the Senate. You might not get confirmed. President Trump really wanted the opposite of that. He wanted, he wanted to know uh, who he was nominating, and he thought the American people should know who he was nominating, which is why he put out a list of potential justices on the campaign. I mean, he was very open, very open on, on what he wanted. Yes, he, well, he was very open on what he wanted. He, he issued a list of 11 The judges. first was 10, yeah. All right? Yeah. And it was 11, I counted them. Second list was 11. The second was 11? Yeah, trust me. Neil Gorsuch wasn't on them. He was on the second list. He was on the second list. Yeah, Neil was on the second list. Yeah. Uh, Kavanaugh wasn't on the list. He was not. He was on the third list. We did a list after, after we were elected. He was on the third yeah. list. <laughs> Brett was on the third list. There's there was Amy was... Barrett and a couple others. Yeah. Um, so how did he, how did he come to, to be selected? Who? Uh, Neil Gorsuch. He knew you. <laughs> Good enough, right? And we double dated for the prom. Georgetown Prep. That's right. A man of South Jersey here. 
um, uh, Judge G Justice Gorsuch uh, was already well known um, among lawyers as a very, very smart guy, very good litigator, practiced at a, a top flight boutique law firm. He was at the Department of Justice under President Bush uh, and was a known entity. He was put on the Tenth Circuit, uh, uh, which is kind of out by Colorado at the tail end of uh, President Bush's uh, second term, uh, and had a fantastic record as a judge. His writings were superb. Uh, when we talked to other petite people who were potentially in the mix, we asked the question, if, if it's not you, who, who would you think is, and everybody else said Neil Gorsuch. Um, substantively, he demonstrated a commitment to the law, uh, to the rule of law, to the ability to read legal text in a way that resonated with me and others. Uh, he also had a very skeptical view of the bureaucratic administrative state. He, his writings were clear that he thought the elected officials make the decisions in the country, not necessarily the bureaucrats. He was very skeptical of a variety of legal doctrines, uh, shorthanded as Chevron and others, a case about Chevron, where courts defer to decisions of agencies uh, and they don't second guess them. And Judge Gorsuch wrote an opinion where he thought that that was probably unconstitutional. It's up to judges to say what the law is and read the legal text, not unelected officials. So that all resonated. And ultimately, you know, he was, the, he was the best guy for the job. He had the paper trail, great writing, had the intellect, had the credentials, and he looks the part. He, he does look the part. He does look the part. Uh, he is, and he, he is Mr. Rogers. He, he, you know, he's, he's like that all the time. Well, you just raised something, and I have a theory. You have a theory, okay. I have a theory. Maybe we'll prove it or disprove I've, it. I've had a theory for, for quite some time. When these, uh, when the confirmation hearings were happening, um, and there was much discussion over Roe versus Wade, and that um, this judge or that judge or this justice or that justice was being selected specifically that they could get in there for Roe versus Wade. And it was always my theory, um, and maybe you could prove it or disprove it, that I did not believe that Roe versus Wade played any role in, those, in their identification. It was all about uh, uh, Chevron. It was all about their position on uh, taking a strict construction uh, on and paring back the administrative state. That's your theory. That's my theory. Well, is there a question in there? Yeah. Oh. Okay. okay. <laughs> to, to, well, to what to what extent to what extent did did Roe versus Wade? Take? Well, you know, it, there was a time where I think judges were picked more for certain positions on certain issues, kind of litmus test issues, where they were quizzed on certain particular cases and that we, kind of thing. We we have a we have a, a judge present tonight who was uh, uh, was the cause celebre uh, over that and who's. Uh, the litmus test stopped, if you remember the Reagan litmus test, um, during this judge's confirmation hearings uh, that was brought up. Uh, it was raised. And well, that, that was then. Uh, we tried to take a more holistic view uh, and get a real sense of where they stood on how to read legal text, how they viewed the separation of powers, the role of government versus the individual, um, and more big picture issues. There, it, the view was if, if you got those right, everything else kind of takes care of itself because your thinking is such that we know you're going to give us you know, serious consideration to all sides of an argument and you're going to approach it in a way as a, as a judge would approach it, not someone who was trying to please this constituency or that constituency. So uh, it, there was, there, we, you, you know, the Senate asked these questions. Did anybody ask you how you would vote in a particular case? So we, we don't. We never did. So they could say, nope, nobody ever asked me. Senators don't ask. And you just you, you get more of a sense of their philosophy and how they approach law. Um, and look, the fact is, is that things change. Byron White um, was put on by Kennedy. Sense was he'd be good on civil rights, and he was. He ended up becoming a conservative icon on the court. Democrats said, oh, my God, I can't believe Kennedy did, did that. Um, you know, and White dissented, my recollection is, in Roe. Um, and this happens, this happened, it, Hugo Black was put on by FDR, senator from Alabama. He also became someone who was viewed much more as a conservative because he was very strict on statutory language. Being a legislator, he was very particular when it came to reading statutes. And, you know, that's, judges are there for life. The issues change. They evolve, they go away, they come into fashion, they come out of fashion. But the way a judge approaches the law and the way he thinks ought not evolve. He should be a consistent uh, umpire, so to speak, and, and whatever size of the strike zone he calls should remain unchanged 
regardless of how much society changes around them. Well, the confirmation process for Justice Kavanaugh mm -hmm. was one of the most contentious and controversial in history. Yes. You were at the center of it. How well, do you he feel? was at the center of it. I was the guy behind him. It, yeah, yeah. You, I was the other you, guy. I was you, the I'm other sorry, guy with the you blue liter tie. You literally had a front row seat. Right. All 50-year-old Irishmen look alike. We're you know, occasionally confused. Right? Um, how do you feel that the, uh, about the, how the confirmation process for Justice Kavanaugh played out? How do I feel about Well, he's on the court, so I, I like that. Right. How it played out, I didn't like it all. I thought it was really, it was, it was a disgrace. Uh, it, was, uh, it was not how it should be run. Um, to try to spring what was sprung, those kind of allegations at the 11th hour, I thought was, uh, was not good. It wasn't all that different what they tried to do to Clarence Thomas. Right? I mean, he had gone through his hearings, and there was a there was a uh, accusation at the end. There, this was this was different in that um, the accusation was regarding alleged conduct that happened long, long, long before. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I I I know Kavanaugh. I've known him a long time. We're not really social friends, but I've known him professionally. He actually swore me in to the Federal Election Commission, so I followed his work. I read all his opinions. Big fan of his body of work. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had been in D.C. his whole career. He had been through a million background checks, highest levels of government, uh, had been in positions where people had, had done opposition research on him. Never, never, never an inkling of anything. And then, you know, kaboom. What's amazing is you go and meet with senators before the hearings. Uh, nothing was ever raised. You, you, you have confidential sessions where people get to raise questions. Nothing was ever raised. Uh, it was only when it became clear that the, the, there were enough votes to confirm them that you know phase two uh, began. So it was really a shame, and it wasn't. It did not. It did not reflect well on on where we are. Um, and I think uh, the question is: Is this a new norm? Is this how it's always going to be? And and I hope not. I hope not. But that, that was but my next question. The fear is that it is. So if you look back in history, let's go back, not too far, but let's go back to, to you know current Supreme Court justices. People forget this. Uh, Justice Breyer uh, was a First Circuit judge before he was on the Supreme Court. He was nominated by President Carter in the uh, early winter of 1980 after the election. He was confirmed after Reagan was elected as a Carter appointee. Now, part of it was he was known to the Senate. He had been counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee, which was run by Senator Kennedy at the time. At that point in history, you didn't mess with Senator Kennedy. But still, he got on a circuit court without a bunch of acrimony. Most of the D.C. circuit judges under Reagan were, were through on unanimous consent. A couple had votes, but even Bork and Thomas went through rather easily for their circuit judgeships. But then something changed in the late 80s, uh, and it became very contentious, and, and it started to get kind of dirty. Uh, then in the 90s, the Republicans, I think, took a step back, and Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer got to the Supreme Court without a lot of the sucker punching that had happened uh, in, the, in the past couple confirmations. Uh, and then the 2000s, things kind of heated up again where the Senate started messing with the rules and kind of changing. There was a time where, for Supreme Court justices, there would not be a filibuster. People forget Clarence Thomas got through with less than 60 votes, there was, but there was a, what's called a cloture vote, meaning enough senators allowed it to go to the final vote. The Democrats didn't block him on procedural grounds. They let it go to a final vote. That began to change, really, in the 2000s. Uh, Jeffords switched parties, Senator Jeffords switched, and Democrats took over the Senate, and they instantly started locking down judicial selection. Uh, and this sort of comedy that used to be the norm in the Senate really started to fall apart. At one point, Senator Reid, as the leader in the Senate, Democrat from Nevada, changed the rules and got rid of the ability of the minority party to, to block any judges. And from there, this thing has now exploded where it's, it's just all out warfare. Well, now there's no more blue slips for. Well, then there is, there is. If there weren't blue slips, you'd have full district judges in New Jersey. Well, and that was so. What the that, blue, so be, so we don't speak code. Yeah, blue yeah. slip is a tradition in the Senate. Literally, it's a blue slip of paper where um, home state senators return it to the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and then the Judiciary Committee chairman takes up the nomination. Some chairman will not take up the nomination unless the home state senator has returned blue slips. Um, for circuit courts, it's never been an absolute veto. Uh, sometimes there's been a couple chairmen who've decided it is. In the 2000s, Chairman Leahy, Democrat from Vermont, decided it was an absolute veto for President Bush's nominee, so a lot of those got blocked. Um, not all chairmen have done that. Um, but for district courts, 
if your home state senators do not really approve of the choices, they're not going to go anywhere. Some states, we had a lot of luck where we got the slate filled. New York, we did quite well. Illinois, we did quite well. California's coming along. New Jersey, well, no district court judges. Well, right now, we are under siege. Our federal judges in New Jersey are under siege. They have some of the highest workloads in the nation. They have all of the pharmaceutical products liability actions. Yep. Patent actions. A lot of multi-district. Every, every night Very my, my email is getting flooded with, with, with the case filings. Cases are taking longer. And some say that the, that, uh, that the court just can't keep up with the massive case, case loads that keep growing every day. So why don't we have, uh, why don't we have uh, relief, replacement judges? Well, it certainly isn't because of me. I tried. Uh, we got a Third Circuit judge tied to New Jersey, Paul Mady. We have a U.S. attorney. But uh, anything else, and that, that was done not really through the Senate. That was a statute that allows the Attorney General to appoint the U.S. Attorney, and that if the Chief Judge then confirms him, right. that person's the U.S. Attorney. Just had no luck with your senators. I tried, being from New Jersey, I, I deviated from my usual plan, and I, I tried to tried to really negotiate with them and come up with a, some kind of compromise, and it just didn't go anywhere. So. It is what it is, but uh, you know, oddly, you go up north, and 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 I was able to work a deal with Chuck Schumer. Uh, Illinois worked out well. Dick Durbin was 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 quite easy to deal with, and we were very candid. We worked out a deal where we got some folks we liked. He got some folks he liked from the district court, um, and even California, uh, after some time, got going. New Jersey stands out as an outlier, where it, it just it's unfortunate because it is a very busy state. A lot of complicated litigation. And look, it's not ideological litigation. It's not like a state that's passing cutting edge social issue stuff where your district judges are going to be doing injunctions and that kind of thing. It's a, it's a court for people who have, you need a work ethic, complicated litigation, pharmaceuticals, not the kind of thing that gets you know, people all fired up on, on social issues. So it should have been something that could have been, should have been, could have been done, but it just wasn't done. And the home state senators, if they don't agree, it's, it's, it's dead in the water. Right. Uh, do you know the status now? Dead in the water, best I can tell. I don't know. We, I mean, we have suggested, when I was in, we suggested names. We put people in background. You know, the, the president is, I, last I heard, he's prepared to make nominations. But uh, if the Senate, particularly the home state senators, throw up a roadblock and, and say they oppose the nominee, it doesn't go anywhere. So it's not really fair to people to nominate them knowing that the, they're not really going to even get a hearing. Um, it was widely reported that you strongly advised against, uh, against the instruction of the president's personal lawyers to submit to questioning to the, by, by the special counsel. It is also widely reported that you were directed to submit to that questioning anyway. At that point, what's your obligation? Well. Wasn't sure where you're going with that. I thought my answer was going to be, I just really, I can't talk about day-to-day -day decisions and all that because of privilege. But really, uh, lawyers work for clients, um, and the privilege belongs to the client, and it's not really up to the lawyer. So if the client says, uh, go testify or whatnot, then that's what you do. So it's not really up to the lawyer to make such decisions. But so, it, my, it, so my role is to, is to, is to, is to follow the direction. So at that point, you show up. You know, you're, you're, you're a lawyer for, right. some, for a client. Right. Are, are you an advocate? Are you a... No, you're a fact witness at that point, where you, you, you're asked what happened, and you have to say what happened. You're not there to make a legal argument. You're, just, you're there to just recount what happened if you get in that situation. And, you know, it's rare it happens. It happens more in the government than in private practice, I suppose. But, um, you know, sometimes it does happen. Happens in corporations sometimes too, where the you know the general counsel may be called as a witness uh, based uh, what happened at a board meeting or that kind of thing, and the company may decide that the general counsel, you know, is the is the is the best one or or someone who has to testify. So it's it's not unprecedented, uh, but it, it doesn't happen every day. But you have to. It's ultimately not your decision. You have to you have to take your direction from elsewhere. Well, um, you ultimately left the job as White House counsel. Right. Everyone does. I, term, I, term limits, uh, if nothing else, caused yeah, that to happen. Well, I read, I read the Twitter feed. Um, af after you left, the executive office of the president was uh, no longer your client. What are your ethical obligations to your former client under the rules that govern all attorneys? 
Well, you have to maintain your duty and loyalty and, and confidentiality and whatnot, even to past clients. That's, that's basic, uh, basic law for lawyers. So merely because someone's no longer your client, that doesn't mean you all of a sudden can go and start telling tales and, and talking. I mean, that's just not, that's not how it works. So it's the same, it's, it's really an unchanged obligation. Right. Well, um, where there is a question over what your obligations are to your former client, mm -hmm. Um, who should decide what, uh, definitively what those obligations are? You, the courts, or your former client? It's a good question. I'm sure there's lots of law review articles on this, and people argue different ways, but I think the basic answer is there's a process for this, and it really depends who's trying to get the testimony. And, and you know, if it's a private person, there's one way to do that. If it's another branch of government, there's you know ways to litigate and compel and, and all that, and I think it varies depending on the situation. But ultimately, it's not the job of the lawyer to be his own lawyer and decide whether or not you know he's obligated to testify. It has to come from from beyond. And when you have a bar card, ultimately you answer to the courts, and and, and the court orders tend to be uh, viewed as the final word. So that's a, that's one potential decider in that. But it certainly is not the attorney. Right. Um, why did you decide to leave the White House? Besides, besides the Twitter feed. Well, the Twitter feed was memorializing kind of what was already. Was, was already out there. Already happening. And, 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 Look, you, and, take, and you, you take these jobs um, not because you're going to be there forever. There was an old time consultant uh, that I met when I was young, and he told me, you know, you take these jobs in Washington, your mail's labeled occupant. You're not there forever. There's somebody there before you, there'll be somebody there after you. You try to do what you can while you can. Um, the average tenure of White House counsels is I think it's about 13 months because it's an intense job and it's a pretty high burnout job. So I went in thinking 18 months to two years was probably what I was going to do. And I did just under two years. So it, it was, uh, I got to the point where I felt like I did all I can do. And uh, it was time to, to go back and, and get reacquainted with things like sunlight and things like that because I'd get to the office before the sun came up. I'd come home long after the sun went down. And I'm already kind of pale, so I wasn't looking too good. Not that I look any better now, but uh, you know, you just you do it while you can, and then you decide. You know, it's time. It's just I've done what I can. It's time to time to do something different. Um, we're getting into our last topic area. Your your perspectives on D.C. Washington is a bit of a crazy place right now. Do you think that we can ever turn? Uh, to return to a time of negotiation, compromise, and cooperation vis-a-vis -vis Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill? Maybe, maybe. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, I think when people are operating from different premises, it's tough to then negotiate on the details. I think there was much more of a common premise that previous generations were operating from, and it made it easier to then negotiate we all agree we're supposed to pave the roads, we can negotiate on you know, how much it's going to cost. Um, I think we still kind of agree we're all supposed to pave the roads, maybe not. But there are issues now where the just the predicate assumptions are so baked in it becomes really tough to, to uh, have compromise. A lot has changed. I used to talk, this is, this is something I talked to your father about a lot, what Washington was like when he was there, what it's like now. Uh, he wasn't 100 percent party line. He, he, always, he always thought about his district his constituent in South Jersey spent a lot of time in intellectual property. That's not the kind of thing to really get you reelected, but you know, intellectual curiosity as a lawyer, he did a lot of good updating copyright law, did a lot in criminal law. Uh, a lot of Democrats were you know, not big on law and order and criminal justice reform and the like, um, and, but he took, you know, he took the subject matter seriously and did it, and, and he didn't vote 100% with Tip O'Neill. Um, and that was, that was considered okay. Nowadays, it's a little bit tougher uh, to, to be someone like that. They're they're kind of they're kind of all gone. Um, D.C. has changed. I understand it socially. When I first moved there, a lot more people lived there who actually were in the house. Uh, a lot of members they don't move their families there anymore. That's in a lot of ways healthy. In other ways, it's unhealthy because you really don't socialize with people. Uh, and if you socialize with people, I think it's a lot easier to get along with them and kind of see where they're coming from and get their perspective. When you don't see them anywhere other than on the field of play on the floor of the house. Because it's much easier to become sort of various camps and that kind of thing. I also think that, um, and this is something that is, is, is probably going to be a little uh, provocative, but 
the TV cameras being everywhere, I think, has made things much more difficult. Transparency has been great. Um, C-SPAN has been great. Wire-to-wire -wire coverage of every deliberation and House hearing and committee hearing and every Senate hearing is great. But it causes people to play to the cameras a little bit. And it causes people, I think, to then put on a little bit more of a show than they would if the cameras weren't there. The House and Senate used to function a lot more away from the glare of the cameras. I'm not talking about the media is in the gallery, the media is there, they can cover it on a day-to-day -day basis. But, but as soon as you make it into sort of a TV show, I think it changes how people behave and it makes it real tough for people to then compromise because people start playing to the camera. I saw this with the Supreme Court confirmations. The nominees go around and meet with senators individually. Those meetings are fascinating, they're substantive, there's a real exchange. Senators are prepared, their staff has prepared them, some senators do it on their own, the nominees prepared. And it's a fascinating discussion that in a lot of ways I wish the American people could see because it would really change their view of how, how Washington works because at that point it's really working. Then when you get into the hearing and the cameras come on and the white lights come on and all that, it's, really a, it's not really a live, you know, it's not really a live show at that point. It's very scripted and, and stilted. And that happens in legislation too where people just get out there and they feel like they have to do a certain thing because it's what, what's expected and they just can't be real. So if we could, maybe people could socialize a little bit more, maybe they could, they could have more of a common understanding. But when, when you're, the only time you talk to somebody is in a format like this, it becomes impossible to say, can't we work this out? Well, let's back up for a second. Were you saying that during some of those confirmation hearings on the pre-meetings with the senators, you would have a cordial and sure. good give and take? Both sides of the aisle, yep. And then the lights would go on, and then you would have some of these attacks and, 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 uh, and the like? Sure. Would, was there any heads up in, in the meeting? Hey, look, I'm, I'm going to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the senators are, you know, they're, they're all serious people, and, and you get a sense of where they're coming from, and you understand they're going to oppose you, so you know how to prepare, and it's a, it's a, it's a dry run. Um, but, uh, you know, they're all civil and, and, and for the most part, polite, and, you know, it, it's, it's sitting in a, a small space, and it's, it's much more collegial. Uh, than when you're sitting in a, you know, a little chair and there's people up in a big dais and there's lights and, and all that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's a whole different environment once you sort of put it into the, into the big stage. Well, quickly I want to talk about... Remember, you, there were Supreme Court justices got on the court without even hearings. I mean, this, the, the modern hearing is something that really has been driven by television. Even if you go back and watch the Thomas hearings or the Bork hearings, Thomas Bork that in that era sat in a chair not unlike this with a table and the senator sat at a similar table the same height maybe to the edge of the stage and it was much closer over time the senate has kind of built it up its seats and the, the the nominee seems to be in a kitty chair and it just is it, it's 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 a whole different dynamic um you know and it's, it's visually it's impressive but when you look at older hearings it's a much tighter environment, and you know when you're, from me to you, it's much tougher to get nasty than if if you know somebody in the third row stands up and starts yelling. Right? Proximity, I think, also breeds a little more collegiality. Well, um, well uh, in parliamentary systems mm -hmm. like England, the uh, the citizens select a party to represent them in the legislature. As we saw in Brexit, individual members are generally not at liberty to vote against their party. And if they do, they will ultimately uh, lose their seat or lose their party support and lose their seat. There is rarely any need for compromise in these systems because the majority party controls the legislature and the executive. Up until now, under our American system, citizens routinely voted for individuals who were known not to always follow in lockstep with your party. You mentioned my father as being mm -hmm. one of them. He was the exception. With, a, with, a, with a, a president and at least one house of Congress controlled by the same party, uh, compromise and consensus appear to be elusive. Are we becoming uh, a more parliamentary system where Americans will have to choose a party in their elective choices? No, I think it's the exact opposite. Exact opposite. Why is that? I, I think you're going to get more in the coalition government where actually not neither party is going to really have enough to get a governing majority. 
in a way, was just similar to Britain in that way. They've already gotten to that point. Okay. Um, and the idea of sort of a party machine dictating how everybody votes, I think, is long gone. Um, and I think what you see are folks being elected on a certain party label, but they're not necessarily going to be, you know, what the party platform is. Uh, I think it's I think it's evolving. Like I said earlier, I think the parties have kind of decoupled from where they used to be, and they're sort of realigning. And I think that uh, it actually is not. We're not going towards uber partisanship. We're going to more of a of a system where it's going to continue to fragment in a way. Are you predicting the rise of a third party? Uh, no, although we've had those every so often in history, right? I mean, there's right. always been that. There's always been that uh, uh, urge, you know, Perot in 1992. Um, the new Whigs, the new, the, the new, new bold the new Whigs, the new Whigs. I mean, the one that really had the most impact was, I mean, when, you know, T.R. Um, uh, his his chosen successor was uh, Taft, and then Taft didn't really fit TR's mold, and ultimately, you know, TR bull moosed him, and then we got Woodrow Wilson. So the third party idea has been with us, and has actually, you know, enacted some significant change, and it, like everything else, kind of goes in waves, but it's never really taken hold uh, in America. I mean, we have sort of a two-party general framework, but what those parties mean has evolved and changed over time, and and that sort of thing. But we're in a, in a time now where uh, the traditional party breakdown is not, is not really producing predictable results. So I, I kind of I agree with kind of the gist of the question, but I, I actually come at it, I, my answer ends up being the opposite of we're moving to some sort of lockstep system. I think it's actually kind of fallen apart a little bit on the, on the party stuff. And part of this is actually parties have lost control over the fundraising and the money, and now, it, 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 the money, the power has moved away from the parties to, to other issue groups and the like. So the party no longer has uh, the lock it had on people. You know, when you think about um, um, politicians of old, you very much had to work your way up through the system and that kind of thing. And now you can just run for Congress and buy a bunch of TV and, you know, do you, and win, and you don't really owe the party anything. You may right. be a Republican or a Democrat, but you don't owe the party anything, right? right. Look at Joe Crowley. Right up in New York. I mean, longtime Democrat, very shrewd politician, very much comes from the era of, of party politics, and you know loses his primary. Uh, Eric Cantor, another guy, brilliant guy from Virginia, lost his primary, uh, and you know this happens from time to time, and we're in that we're in that stage. Um, balance of power, right between the uh, executive and the and the uh, legislative. Um, there are some who believe that the executive has broad and sweeping powers that eclipse both Congress uh, and, in some cases, enacted laws. What is the basis for that philosophy? You tell me. What, wait, executive power trumps enacted laws? Well, well, the, uh, the, there's, there's because there's a, the, well, there's, let's put this in English. There's. There are, each branch has its powers, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, Congress has a new winter powers, executive branch is more executive power, whatever that may mean, um, and that's something that we've been trying to define now for a couple hundred years. Congress will occasionally pass statutes, they've passed more and more of them over the past several decades than they had for 150 years, where the president does something they don't like, it probably is something that the president has the power to do under the Constitution, the Congress kind of acknowledges it, and they pass a statutory framework trying to get the president to sort of do it within the bounds Congress sets. This has been something that has gone on for years. Easy example that has nothing to do with current events, so as to not get everybody all excited, uh, although it kind of does, because it came up as a war powers resolution. It came about Vietnam, uh, and that requires the president, if he uses force, to report to Congress, and Congress can sort of rein that in and the like. President has never conceded the constitutionality of the War Powers Resolution. When the president submits the paper to Congress, it's never done pursuant to the War Powers Resolution. The paper says it is consistent with the War Powers Resolution. So that is a sort of this constitutional fight that you see where the president thinks as commander in chief he has the power to do something. The Congress thinks because they have the power to declare war, they have something. And we've been sort of, the branches have been fighting this out. And that's an example where the president thinks his power under the Constitution trumps an enacted law. Well, How about you, that for landing that one on my feet? You did land that. Yeah. You, you stuck it. That was great. Yeah. Um, but is it a zero-sum game? 
So to the extent that Congress has power, has does the executive have less power? No, not uh, necessarily. Vice not vice necessarily. There are, the, our history has been one to tug a war between the branches as to who makes the ultimate decisions. Um, you know, Thomas Jefferson didn't think the president had the power to buy land. Then he became president, and the Louisiana Purchase came on the table. And apparently he was very pained, and he decided he actually did have the power. So sometimes, you know, when you're in the legislature, you don't think the president has the power. Then when you're in the presidency, all of a sudden, you know, maybe you do have the power. So this is why we have a system of necessary tension between the branches. I see it as a feature, not a bug. And it's not really a zero-sum game. There's shared powers. There's powers that are clearly one branch and not other branches. And it's, it's part of our democratic experiment of self-government where there is this natural, healthy tension where they have to fight it out. And part of it is it influences voters. I mean, voters matter. Voters think that the legislature should rein in the president and the political will is there. It's a lot easier for the legislature to do that. If the, if the, if the will of the people is more on the president's side, presidential power is probably going to follow that. But this is not something new. It's been with us for a long, long time. Well, in your opinion, what reforms can be implemented to foster compromise in the future? That's a good question. How about bringing back the traditional filibuster? That if you want to filibuster, you got to stay up there and... Uh... Well, that's interesting, right? You actually have to stand up and explain yourself. Now you just have to kind of file a piece of paper and you can right. filibuster and go to, you know, go to the restaurant, have a nice dinner, and you're filibustering. Right. right? It sort of defeats the idea of a deliberative body. Um, you know, I think that to the extent that elected officials are actually in the chamber and have to actually engage in the moment, that might help. Now, very much done remote on TV from their offices. Staff does a lot of the work, that kind of thing. Um, I think, uh, you know, to the extent, it, but look, it, we, it, it, it has to come from within. The elected officials have to take the initiative, I think, to try to reach out and try to figure out other things they can solve. Um, you know, the, 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 the recent uh, trade deal passed Congress, massive bipartisan support. If copyright reform just went through, it's supposed to give songwriters a little bit more peace of their royalties because of internet streaming and like, passed with bipartisan support. There have been a lot of bipartisan bills. They're just not in areas that get everybody worked up, although the trade bill should, but still, both sides came together on that one. So there are, you know, for the idea that it's polarized and nothing's getting done, the record really doesn't reflect that if you take a look at at least, a, you know, a couple pieces of legislation. What you have are a lot of bills that never go anywhere and, you know, right. big knockdown drag outs on things. But, you know, every, everything goes in cycles. You look under Bill Clinton, you know, welfare reform or a number of things where you had Newt Gingrich running around in the House with the Republicans and you had the Senate Republicans and you had Clinton. And they actually ended up being very productive legislatively. At the time, it didn't feel that way. It felt very divisive, very personal, uh, at times petty. But when you look at it, they actually passed... Uh, some very significant legislation. So it can be done. It's been done in our lifetime. Very good. As long as we kind of agree on the premise. We have a lot of students here tonight. Okay, that's good. What are you They're probably not the ones wearing the suits. <laughs> Although maybe, who knows? Um, what advice do you have for them? Um, find something you're passionate about. Try to get some skills. Don't be sort of a master of everything, right? Uh, and when you're young, try out different things. Try to, try to take some risks, and it may pay off. But pay your dues. Whatever you want to do, you can find something that you're passionate about. People may pay you for it, and that would be wonderful. But uh, what I see, at least with lawyers, is there's people who skip steps. They don't, really, they don't really put the hours in when they're young. They take easier jobs. They change jobs a lot. And when they get older, kind of our age, all of a sudden they really don't have clients, they really don't have much to do because they really haven't learned the basics of their craft. And this applies to everything from people who want to be chefs to lawyers to doctors to, you know, you have to pay your dues. So I would say dig in, you know, and while you're young, learn it now and, and take some chances and really try to master something. Yeah, but this law thing is just your hobby. I mean, you have real talent, right? No. Come on, I come don't. on, tell them, tell them. He, play, he, play, he plays the guitar. Yeah, well, a lot and, of people play the guitar. In, in 80s and 90s bands. Well, I, I, I used to be, but I'm retired. You're retired? I am. I'm retired. Yeah, too busy. But yeah, have, I've been I, playing my whole life, and I, I uh, kind of picked up piano when I was little. My parents got me piano lessons. Uh, a guy named Buddy Chapman, who was a local jazz piano player, had a trio. Uh, 
and fantastic opportunity to work with him. And then I took guitar lessons from a guy named Tom Hawk, who had a guitar studio in Atlantic City. Tommy Hawk, yeah, yeah Tom. And so Tom still actually is my tech. He still sets up my guitars, and he's still around. And Tom was sort of the local rock star, still is in a lot of ways, of South Jersey. And, um, and so I learned from him, and I, I learned a lot. I didn't realize how much I learned from him. I learned all the modes of the scale and everything when I was like 12, uh, and kind of forgot it, and then got back into it and been playing kind of my whole life and played in bands and been fortunate enough to occasionally play with people who do it for a living and, and all that. But you know, When you leave here, go on YouTube. There's there's some great there, yeah, there's some great footage of him down in Dewey Beach. Right. The recent well the recent one was actually at the MGM Casino outside of DC. A band called Winger, platinum recording artist, won a lot of awards. I actually got up and played with them. Uh, you got up and played with them? Yeah. yeah. You're gonna go on tour with them? No, no. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Law pays a little better now than than, than that. But I understand. Uh, yeah. So I, I've been very fortunate that I've I've met you know people who do it for real. And that's a tough life because it's not the sort of thing where you have a steady paycheck. You have to work it every day, uh, and all those guys are are, are making, making a go of it, and they do a lot of things from playing live to they still put out their own music, but you know, not, not a lot of people buy records like they used to. They do soundtracks, video game music, all kinds of things to, to make it going because it's their passion, and they've managed to figure out a way to make a living at their passion. So it can be done, but it's not easy. Hey, all right, well. And I, I didn't have the, you know, I, I never really decided to just go all in and be a starving artist. I, I uh, you know, I, my, my parents were very, very wise to say, no, you know what, you're probably better off with the books. With the books. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, what is, what is your favorite song of the 80s or 90s? What's the best one? Uh, the fa well, that's a broad, I mean, I, I also, I'm a contemporary. I keep up with the times, but uh, right now, I have, it, 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 it's sort of the Desert Island, probably Tom Sawyer by Rush. Okay. Yeah. And best. Uh, yeah, thanks for one guy clap. Thanks. That's good. Rush head. Good. Uh, best guitarist. Best guitarist, like ever, or ever. most influential? It's tough ever. to say. I mean, whoa. Come on. Jeez, too many. I mean, for me, Van Halen's kind of the, the, right, the big bang and, and the guy yeah. that sort of, see, we lost sort it. of lost put it all together. It's a smattering of applause. But, yeah. you know, a lot of good players out there, and everybody kind of does their thing. But right. Van Halen really kind of reset it. And for people our age, was the, the guy who really right. got it going. And then there was a good 10 to 15 years of imitators of Van Halen that just drove so much of pop music. So... In, you know, as far as being impactful, he certainly is best. And right. in, in my book, he's he's the guy. Well, I want to thank Don McGann for coming tonight. Uh, he took the took the time out. And and I would like to thank all of you for coming. My sisters and their husbands, Barbara Sullivan, Lynn Hughes, and their husbands, Barry Sullivan and Doug Walker, are here. The Hughes Center, the Hughes Center has been doing this uh, ever since my, my father created it. And it is only here through your support. And we can only put these programs together with your help. So I would strongly ask you uh, to consider uh, helping us continue this mission uh, and continue to have uh, these programs uh, and support our community. Don, thank you so very much for Thanks, coming. Thanks, Bill, for the opportunity. It's been great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I think that was terrific. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you for being here, and have a good evening. Don't forget your popcorn. <laughs>